Bless God and greetings. Right now, I have a topic that should be short, and there's a spirit and his foul spirit, unclean, before God, and God is ready to destroy it, is the spirit that goes around saying, you know, well, Jesus talked like that, you know, but you're not allowed. Okay. And if a person in their miserable state of being without judgment and without proper love of their neighbor and without allowing someone to be honest with someone like Elamaz or, you know, Demas or Alexander the Coppersmith or, you know, just not allowing the created order of saints to speak what they want without reviling, but in pure honesty. If they get deep enough into this, and they're looking any way to stretch this out, there is something they might say, and it's about quite possibly the last thing they might say in the land of the living. God could just strike them down. Because I know God's angry about this. For the scripture does say, if a man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And if he does minister, let him do so as the ability that God gives. Okay, so here we have a man who is able to speak by the oracles of God. And by the ability that God has given him. I see men with great ability in the Bible. Stephen, the Apostle Paul. I talked about Acts 13 already. I see Acts 7. I see how they taught, they corrected, but they weren't necessarily your quote-unquote nice guy, okay? We all know nice guys finish last, even, you know, a saying of the heathen, okay? And nice guys, in this context, they don't teach all the commandments. They don't do them, you know? So they shall be least, okay? Which is not a good thing. It's just a incredible understatement and credible in the fact that it's true that you're going to go to hell. Okay. And I see the fruit of you people. I see the fact that you love people who are killers. You love people that are men stealers. You love people that are home wreckers. I've seen it. I've seen this sort of filthy spirit before God that says you can't talk like that. That's how Jesus talked. You can't talk like that. And meanwhile, they're a lover of those that hate Jesus. And you wonder why they don't like us talking like that. And the reason why is because they're demonized and they get agitated. The devils in them get rattled. Okay. You can rebuke someone who's clearly a devil and do it in a way they don't like and they get rattled. They know that the person's evil that you're rebuking by just the fact that they don't like the way you're doing it. Rattled. And the reason why is because they're possessed. Okay? Let's make no mistake about this. Now, Jesus and the Psalms. Okay? So, I read something that I believe that it was within accuracy. Okay? But I'm going to real fine touch it. Okay? And then you tell me now where you're going to go on this. All right? The Psalms, in cases, are direct sayings of the Messiah. Like, literally, you know, into your hands I commit my spirit. Okay? And, yes, that's a true saying. Okay? And, well, he, let me just go to it. Because we're talking about Psalms. All right? So, I'll go to Psalm 31. Just in case I didn't hit it word for word. So it says in Psalm 31, verse 5, Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Okay, people like that saying, you know, it's in the Gospel of Luke, of course. Jesus died for us. Okay, bless God. Now it also says, I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. Now, if you don't believe the next saying, you don't believe the former saying. And that means you're an unbeliever, okay? You might say, well, no, I believe this. Verse 5. Well, if you don't believe verse 6, 
and you're not taking Jesus for how he really feels, you're an unbeliever. And the unbelievers have their part in the lake of fire. Okay? So know that. You need to get right with God today. Okay? You need to fear God today. Okay? You need to have the mind of Christ today. Okay? You don't get all your, you know, twisting of sayings. No, you get either the full dose and the allotment that the Spirit gives. Okay? You go by the measure that God gives you. But it's not private. Okay? This measure is open, and we're open to judge, okay? And the measure you meet, it shall be measured back to you, okay? And you that hear more shall be given. So hear that. Hear this teaching, okay? Now, Jesus, that is Jesus now. So now, hypothetically, if you're trying to get out of it, say, well, that's the Son of God. We can't say something like that. How dare we even think about it? I mean, all right, here's where you're in trouble, okay? Because now, and those that know the truth know that Jesus is the angel of God, okay? And Yahweh speaks of sending an angel, okay? And the angel is told and spoke to us and this is in the Torah that we need to obey him and he has the ability to pardon so we know this is not Michael or Gabriel or you know a created cherub or something okay this is the son of God pre-incarnate okay now here's what David says in Psalm 35. So you can't get at this one and say, this is actually Jesus talking. No, this is David, okay? It's the Holy Ghost, but it's David, okay? And notice how the Holy Ghost, because we know the Holy Ghost is in David, notice how the Holy Ghost, where the Holy Ghost is on this. And you're going to start to see that the Son and the Spirit are also pleading with God, the Father, on the destruction of sinners. See, you have to understand this about the Son of God, okay? He first loved us. This is true. What is in His love is that the fact that He listened to what the Father gave Him and put before him. And yes, we are ambassadors of Christ. And yes, I believe what it says in 2 Corinthians 5. That God could have just as well sent us to hell. The first time we chose to sin. He's given us a chance. I believe God is merciful. I believe God is kind. Okay. Because that does make sense. It's not just something I learned because I was told it. It does make sense that when you create everyone good that you create people to serve you, we, as the way we are created, we understand that it is also acceptable to forgive people. So we understand both the goodness and the severity of God. You know, it's one place to juggle the immense balance here and the seismic, okay? But allow me to say, yes, it is, nature is, in harmony with forgiving someone, so we can see why the Father has given at least one chance to a sinner. It could be multiple chances over the span of a lifetime. But I see that the Son is under the Father, okay? Pre-incarnate as well, okay? Also now in a glorified body. And the Son wants the vengeance. I know this. I know what held the Son together in the flesh was obeying his God, his Father, I know that. It was not, though, because Jesus is like 100% just love, okay? Or at the best, people teach like 99.9%. .9%. Like they never teach the wrath of the Lamb, okay? And you really got to be about 50-50, okay, to really have it in life. The way you live life, the way you understand doctrine, you got to have it 50-50, Okay. And you really can't just preach one without the other. Okay. You got to have a good balance on this. Okay. 
So that means that I do believe the son wants to see sinners go to hell as much as he wants to mediate for them and save them because he himself just waits on the father. He just waits on the father. Okay. He's the one that saves, but he's also the one that damns. Okay. And I'm going to read this. Okay. So Psalm 35. Okay. I'll just read, we'll just read a verse three. So we realize a man with the Holy Ghost has people against him. And how is the Holy Ghost guiding us to think? Verse 3, Psalm 35. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Okay, so this is about salvation now to the soul. What else is right there? Well, draw out the spear also. Okay, so we're ambassadors of Christ, our Warfare is not carnal, all right? But yet this is a man speaking to God. So we know that God has jurisdiction to do this if he wanted to. If God wanted to slay your enemies to protect you in a situation, God's going to do that, okay? And they would not disagree with this psalm at all. Because you in your heart, you're in Christ. You're doing it how Jesus did it. Jesus came one time to save. He comes the next time to damn. Okay, so that's a phenomenal measure that we have partaken in the salvation that Jesus has given us and partaking in the spirit of the kingdom, okay, that's coming, okay, to understand the kingdom. Let them be confounded, verse 4, and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Okay, so this intense, all right, there's nothing here that's, you know, harmonious in our society. Most people in churches don't come close to this. They don't see this. They don't feel this. Okay. And those that do, they do it maybe unjustly because this is not bitterness. This is not malice. This is the knowledge of God, the fear of God that the father is not happy. Okay. With sin. And although he's offering this mercy, he only does offer it for a short time. Eternity is, you know, eternal. Okay. So yes, God is pitiful. It shows the gravity of sin, how bad sin is. God's giving a chance, but it's still only a short time. Okay. You can't really sway that. Okay. When you put that to meditation, you realize, you know, the Father is indeed angry. Okay? So now here's the voice of the Spirit of God. Referring to who? The angel of the Lord. Verse 5. Let them be as chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. Now, so you can't say, man, this is only Jesus. No, this is a man who's a created being, who was a sinner, who got delivered, and in his deliverance, having the Holy Ghost filling, says, let the angel of the Lord persecute them and chase them. Now that is something you cannot confound. So let you, yourself sinner, be confounded because you're not going to confound this. Okay. So this is the Holy Ghost in a man calling out to the Father to have the pre-incarnate Son of God chase and persecute his enemies. And that is the gospel of the kingdom. When people say, come Lord Jesus, or they pray thy kingdom come, or we see saints who even made it. They died in faith. They made it. They're worshiping the father and the son. They are in heaven. They still want the son of God to come back. They're still asking how long. There is no other spirit. If you've received another spirit, you are accursed from God. There is no other teaching. 
Now let's see it in action. So in 2 Samuel 24, I think is where I want to go here. Let me see if I can find those. And let's see. Yeah. I'll read it. 2 Samuel 24. I'll start at verse 14. So David again. So David's on the wrong end of this, you would say, at this point. So David got right with God before he died. So... You know, we're thankful that God gives salvation because, you know, David, of all the men in the Bible, what a miserable eternity this man would have had, you know. But he, he did die in faith, and he showed so many different things in his life, what faith looks like, which is great. He also shows what a bitter repentance looks like, okay. Um, and this was a bitter repentance toward the time of his death. But God used him mightily when his heart was right with him. So bless God. And here in the 14th verse, 2 Samuel 24. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed, and there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba. 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, it is enough, stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Arunah the Jebusite. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. So the angel was cutting down the very seed of Jacob. Okay? And... The one over the angel in headship sent the angel. And the one over the angel, you know, called it off there. Enough had been done. And there was much blood shed. And it was God that was doing it. Okay. Now, David got himself on the wrong side of that. Okay. And, you know, David was in a bad spot. But David realized his sin. And what I see here in a figure is actually on the day of the Lord, when Jesus comes back, he's just going to do this. I mean, the Father has already given him the direction. We already see it in prophecy. Every sinner is going to get it. There is going to be someone like David who repents. You know, when they see Jesus, they understand, you know, the sheep or the sheep, you know, they're in a state of repentance. Um, this is only a figure, okay? But, you know, the blood is going to get shed, okay? And the Father is not calling it off. So here's the bottom line, is Jesus is a man of war, okay? And Jesus has slayed so many people. You know, the problem is, is you know, sinners in these churches, they don't understand who Jesus is. They talk about someone named Jesus who is a demon, okay? It's not the Jesus of the Bible, Jesus has slayed so many people, even of his own chosen people, okay? And this he did before he came into the body. And then he comes into the body and he says many things and he does many things that are aggressive, okay? And still somehow, some way, people tune that out. And then they disconnect him from Yahweh, in the Old Testament, they disconnect him from his office under the Father, and he's the angel that destroys, okay, in these situations, okay? And they've just disconnected everything. And then what you realize is that people just do everything backward then, and their thoughts are backward, their judgment's backward, and what do you end up missing? You end up missing the gospel, because this is the gospel of the kingdom, that Jesus would come back and take the kingdom. And he's taking up the seat that David basically had to vacate, okay? And Solomon had to 
get it taken from him because of their own sins and God's not a respecter of persons. And he's taken it back, you know, and those men got it through sinners dying. And it's the same way Jesus is going to take it. And to be quite honest with you, this is not complicated. It's that you do not want to believe it. And that's why I'm saying you're an unbeliever, you know, you know, we want to talk about head knowledge. We use other scriptures to refer to your head knowledge. It's not saving you. You're going to be on the wrong end of this because when Jesus comes back and you realize, well, he's a man of war. I mean, you know what he said in Luke 19? I mean, do you fear God? You know, you're either going to be with him or you're not. It's one or the other on that day. So you're going to see on that day what type of heart that you have for God. And most people are going to realize that they just don't have a heart for God. And yeah, this is extremely important. I can't emphasize this, you know, too hard. You know, I mean, this, you have to get right with God on this. And you need to come to terms with this because if this is not the way it is, then you can't make sense of the Bible. You can't make sense with the covenant to David. You cannot make sense with the day of the Lord. You can't make sense with the second coming. And once we get to the point where we cannot make sense of these things, then there is nothing actually to believe other than your own message, your own made up thing. Okay. And I mean, even Paul speaks about this and the vengeance of Jesus and the coming of Jesus and, you know, Second Thessalonians. I mean, it's just there, okay? And it's there to be received. You know, you need to receive this. And you really need to, in that way, be like David was. You know, it's a little different, of course. But you have to understand the truth of God and the wrath of God and just say, you know, listen, I'm in sin. You know, I'm rejecting this message. I'm rejecting what these prophecies are telling us. You know, I repent, you know, I am humbling myself before you, you know, and, you know, heal me of this because, I mean, this is just all kinds of wickedness that you have in your heart to reject what God is doing, okay? You know, your heart is desperately wicked when you can't receive God's judgment, okay? And then it goes all the way back to we can't even talk like Jesus. Well, you can't get around even the Psalms, even if you're a little bit more knowledgeable and you know, Psalms are words of the Messiah and you just say, well, it's only Jesus can say something like Psalm 58 or, you know, the Psalm where it talks about, you know, basically the mercy of God destroying, you know, my enemies and all these different things. To cut off them and to slay them in the mercy of God and just paraphrasing that one, but these Psalms are there, all right? And even if you're a little bit more knowledgeable and you're trying to talk yourself out of more and you say, well, only Jesus can say those. Well, what about the Psalm where the prophet inspired by the spirit of God is asking God to send the son of God? I mean, how else you get around this? I mean, you know, a three-fold cord is not quickly broken. You're not going to break this. You're not going to break the man with the Holy Ghost calling out to the Father to send the Son of God. You're just not going to break this. So in Jesus' name, repent or be damned into hell.